following is an audio renaissance presentation. Hello, I'm Bill Hartley, president of Audio Renaissance. I'm very pleased to introduce you to this special two-cassette edition of Napoleon Hill's classic, Think and Grow Rich, co-produced by Audio Renaissance Tapes and Cassette Productions Unlimited. This unique presentation of Think and Grow Rich combines excerpts from the book read by Joe Slattery with personal anecdotes told by the author himself, Napoleon Hill. Because there's so much valuable information contained in every minute of this two-hour program, we've included a self-help success manual designed for you to use along with the audio cassettes. We hope that it'll assist you in organizing your study of Napoleon Hill's philosophy of success and that it'll become a record of your personal growth as you think and grow rich. Just before we begin, I'd like to give you the following information from the publisher's preface. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, published by Fawcett Crest, New York, copyright 1937 by Napoleon Hill. Revised edition, copyright 1960 by Combined Registry Company. Copyright under International and Pan American Copyright Conventions. All rights reserved and transferred, January 1963, to Napoleon Hill Foundation, Charleston, South Carolina. And now, here's Joe Slattery with Napoleon Hill and our special presentation of Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich is one of the most influential books of all time in pointing the way to personal achievement, to financial independence, and to riches of the spirit beyond measurement in money. There has never been another book like it, nor ever can be. It was inspired by Andrew Carnegie, who disclosed his formula of personal achievement to the author, Napoleon Hill, many years ago. Carnegie not only made himself a multimillionaire, but he made millionaires of more than a score of men to whom he taught his secret. Another 500 wealthy men revealed the source of their riches to Napoleon Hill, who has spent a lifetime of research in bringing their message to people in all walks of life who are willing to give their thoughts, ideas, and organized plans in return for riches. The riches within your grasp cannot always be measured in money. There are great riches in lasting friendships, harmonious family relationships, sympathy and understanding between business associates, an inner harmony which brings peace of mind measurable only in spiritual values. The philosophy of Think and Grow Rich will prepare you to attract and enjoy these higher estates which always have been and always will be denied to all except those who are ready for them. Everyone desires to be rich, but not everyone knows what constitutes enduring riches. And most people believe riches to consist only in material things that money can buy. Now here is a list of the 12 things which constitute real riches. Number one, a positive mental attitude. Observe that it heads the list. And second, sound physical health. And third, harmony in human relations. And fourth, freedom from fear. And fifth, the hope of future achievement. And sixth, the capacity for applied faith. And seven, willingness to share one's blessings with others. Eight, to be engaged in a labor of love. Nine, an open mind on all subjects toward all people. Ten, complete self-discipline. Eleven, wisdom with which to understand people. And twelve, financial security. Observe, if you will, with great benefit, the fact that money comes at the end of the list of the twelve things that make men rich. Be prepared when you begin to put the philosophy of Think and Grow Rich into action for a changed life which will not only ease the trials and stresses of living, but will also prepare you for the accumulation of material riches in abundance. In every chapter of this book, mention has been made of the money-making secret which has made fortunes for hundreds of exceedingly wealthy men whom I have carefully analyzed over a long period of years. If you are ready to put it to use, you will recognize this secret at least once in every chapter. I wish I might feel privileged to tell you how you will know if you are ready, 
but that would deprive you of much of the benefit you will receive when you make the discovery in your own way. As a final word of preparation, before you begin the first chapter, may I offer one brief suggestion which may provide a clue by which the Carnegie secret may be recognized. It is this. All achievement, all earned riches, have their beginning in an idea. If you are ready for the secret, you already possess one half of it. Therefore, you will readily recognize the other half the moment it reaches your mind. When you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with definiteness of purpose, with little or no hard work. You and every other person ought to be interested in knowing how to acquire that state of mind which will attract riches. I spent 25 years in research because I too wanted to know how wealthy men became that way. My brother and I had uh, matriculated at Georgetown University Law School intending to become lawyers. We didn't have any money, but I did have ability to write, and I promised that I would uh, write stories about successful men, sell them to the magazines, and pay our way through. And my first assignment, fortunately, was with Andrew Carnegie in Pittsburgh. He gave me three hours. And when the three hours were over, he said, now, uh, this interview is just beginning. Uh, come on out the house, stay all night. And uh, after dinner, we'll uh, take up the interview again. He kept me there three days and nights. And believe you me, I was more than flattered. I wondered what it was all about. He kept talking to me about the need for a new philosophy. He said, we've had many philosophies from the days of Socrates and Plato on down to the days of William James and Emerson. But most of them dealt with uh, the moral laws of life. What we need is an economic philosophy for the man of the streets that will enable him to make use of the know-how gained by men like myself over a lifetime of experience. Well, it sounded uh, very nice to me, except for one thing. I didn't know exactly what that word philosophy meant. And finally, at the end of the third day, he, he said, now look here, I have been talking to you for three days about the need for a new philosophy, and I'm going to ask you a question about it. If I commission you to become the author of this philosophy, give you letters of introduction to men whose uh, experiences you will need in collaboration with yourself, are you willing to put in 20 years of research, because that's how long it will take, paying your own way as you go along without any subsidy from me, yes or no? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there have been many times in my life when I have faced uh, difficult problems and difficult decisions. And I don't think I ever faced one more embarrassing than that. Because when Mr. Carnegie put that proposition to me, I was, my hand was down in my pocket, and I was fiddling with the money that I had there, just about enough to get back to Washington. And if I had to stay at a hotel instead of Mr. Carnegie's house, I wouldn't have had that much. I didn't even know the meaning of the word philosophy. And here, the richest man in the world wanted me to go to work for him for 20 years without pay. <laughs> Wasn't that a situation for you? I started to tell Mr. Carnegie, I, I started to do just exactly what you or the most of us uh, people would have done under the same circumstances. And what do you think that was? What would you have done if you would have faced that sort of a proposition, going to work for 20 years without any pay for the richest man in the world? Well, yes, that's what I was about to do. <laughs> but something inside of me wouldn't let me open my mouth until I got a hunch that if Mr. Carnegie had kept me there for three days, it must have been for a purpose. That he must have seen something in me that I didn't know was there. Also, that man, a man with, with Mr. Carnegie's reputation for picking men certainly didn't pick me to do a job like that unless he knew I had the ability to do it. And whatever this something was, this silent, invisible person that was standing, looking over my shoulder and whispering in my ear, said, go ahead and tell him yes. I said, Mr. Carnegie, I not only will accept the commission, sir, but you may depend upon it that I will complete it. He said, I like the way you ended that sentence up, and I think you'll do it. You have the job. The only contribution Mr. Carnegie ever made to me outside of introducing me where I needed to be introduced was to pay my expenses in the early part of my relationship with him. The first man he sent me to see was Henry Ford. Now he said, I want you to go up to uh, Detroit, become acquainted with Henry Ford, observe him carefully because one of these days he's going to dominate the uh, motor industry. 
and it's going to be second only to the steel industry. This was in 1908, the late fall of 1908, ladies and gentlemen. I went up there and spent two days trying to find Ford, and when I did find him, he came out of the rear of a shop where he'd been doing some experimenting with an old pair of overalls on, a plug hat or a, 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 a derby hat that had been bashed in the crown, the grease all over his hands. I remember he got my shirt sleeves dirty when I shook hands with him. And uh, I sat down for a half hour with Mr. Ford, and about all uh, of his conversation consisted of yes and no, mostly no. And I wondered how a man like Mr. Carnegie could have made a mistake like that. Imagine if Mr. Ford would ever be a leader in anything. <laughs> well, I won't tell you the rest of it. That's enough. Desire. The starting point of all achievement. The first step toward riches. A long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation which made it necessary for him to make a decision which ensured his success on the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe, whose men outnumbered his own. He loaded his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy's country, unloaded soldiers and equipment, then gave the order to burn the ships that had carried them. Addressing his men before the first battle, he said, You see the boats going up in smoke. That means that we cannot leave these shores alive unless we win. We now have no choice. We win or we perish. They won. Every person who wins in an undertaking must be willing to burn his ships and cut all sources of retreat. Only by so doing can one be sure of maintaining that state of mind known as a burning desire to win, essential to success. Every human being who reaches the age of understanding of the purpose of money wishes for it. Wishing will not bring riches, but desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence which does not recognize failure, will bring riches. Six ways to turn desires into gold. The method by which desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite practical steps. That is, first, fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. It is not sufficient merely to say, I want plenty of money. Be definite as to the amount. There is a psychological reason for definiteness, which will be described in a subsequent chapter. Second, Determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the money you desire. There is no such reality as something for nothing. Third, establish a definite date when you intend to possess the money you desire. Fourth, create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once, whether you are ready or not, to put this plan into action. Fifth, write out a clear, concise statement of the amount of money you intend to acquire Name the time limit for its acquisition, state what you intend to give in return for the money, and describe clearly the plan through which you intend to accumulate it. Sixth, read your written statement aloud twice daily, once just before retiring at night and once after arising in the morning. As you read, see and feel and believe yourself already in possession of the money. It is important that you follow the instruction described in these six steps. It is especially important that you observe and follow the instructions in the sixth paragraph. You may complain that it's impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Here is where a burning desire will come to your aid. If you truly desire money so keenly that your desire is an obsession, you will have no difficulty in convincing yourself that you will acquire it. The object is to want money and to become so determined to have it that you convince yourself you will have it. Can you imagine yourself a millionaire? To the uninitiated, who has not been schooled in the working principles of the human mind, these instructions may appear impractical. It may be helpful to all who fail to recognize the soundness of the six steps to know that the information they convey was received from Andrew Carnegie, who began as an ordinary laborer in the steel mills, but managed, despite his humble beginning, 
to make these principles yield him a fortune of considerably more than one hundred million dollars. It may be a further help to know that the six steps here recommended were carefully scrutinized by the late Thomas A. Edison, who placed his stamp of approval upon them as being not only the steps essential for the accumulation of money, but for the attainment of any goal. The steps call for no hard labor. They call for no sacrifice. They do not require one to become ridiculous or credulous. To apply them calls for no great amount of education. But the successful application of these six steps does call for sufficient imagination to enable one to see and to understand that accumulation of money cannot be left to chance, good fortune, and luck. One must realize that all who have accumulated great fortunes first did a certain amount of dreaming, hoping, wishing, desiring, and planning before they acquired money. You may as well know right here that you can never have riches in great quantity unless you can work yourself into a white heat of desire for money and actually believe you will possess it. If the thing you wish to do is right and you believe in it, go ahead and do it. Put your dream across, and never mind what they say if you meet with temporary defeat, for they, perhaps, do not know that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. Thomas Edison dreamed of a lamp that could be operated by electricity, began where he stood to put his dream into action, and despite more than 10,000 failures, he stood by that dream until he had made it a physical reality. Practical dreamers do not quit. Imagine a man, for instance, standing by through 10,000 different failures, as Mr. Edison did, before giving up. His uh, personal initiative was so definite that he told me that if he hadn't found the secret of the incandescent electric lamp, that at that very moment he would be in the laboratory working on it instead of being out there wasting his time talking with me. And then in a more serious note, Mr. Edison said, uh, You know, I had to succeed because I finally ran out of things that wouldn't work. And I've thought of that so many times, wondering why more people don't keep on keeping on until they run out of things that won't work, for then they're bound to find the thing that will work. There is a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one is ready for a thing until he believes he can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief, not mere hope or wish. Open-mindedness is essential for belief. Closed minds do not inspire faith, courage, and belief. Remember, no more effort is required to aim high in life, to demand abundance and prosperity, than is required to accept misery and poverty. I believe in the power of desire backed by faith, because I have seen this power lift men from lowly beginnings to places of power and wealth. I have seen it rob the grave of its victims. I have seen it serve as the medium by which men stage to come back after having been defeated in a hundred different ways. I have seen it provide my own son with a normal, happy, successful life, despite nature's having sent him into the world without ears. When my second son Blair was born, he was born without ears. And the doctors told me that he would be a deaf mute all of his life. I told them he would not be a deaf mute and that he would live to have 100% of his hearing just like other children. And one of these doctors came over and put his arm on my shoulder, and he said, Now look here, Napoleon, there are some things in this world that neither you nor I nor anyone else can do anything about, and now you face one of those situations. I said, Doctor, there is nothing in this world that I can't do something about if it's nothing more than adjust myself to an unpleasant situation so it does not destroy my spirit. I went to work on that child through prayer before I ever saw him. I worked on him continuously, almost four hours a day for the first four years of his life. And at the age of about 18 months, we recognized that he was beginning to hear. We didn't know just how much. But by the time he had reached the fourth year, he had developed 65% of his normal hearing. And in his third year in college, in the University of West Virginia, the Acoustican Company, manufacturer of hearing aids, heard about this unusual case, the only one of its kind in the world where a child born without ears ever learned to hear came down to the University of West Virginia and made him a special hearing aid that gave him the other 35% of his hearing, and Blair today has 100% of his hearing just exactly like I said he would. 
It's almost one of the modern miracles of medical science that this thing happened. And the doctors today don't know exactly how it did happen. I'm not so sure that I did, but I know what I was doing to help bring it about. Faith is the head chemist of the mind. When faith is blended with thought, the subconscious mind instantly picks up the vibration, translates it into its spiritual equivalent, and transmits it to infinite intelligence, as in the case of prayer. The emotions of faith, love, and sex are the most powerful of all the major positive emotions. When the three are blended, they have the effect of coloring thought in such a way that it instantly reaches the subconscious mind, where it is changed into its spiritual equivalent, the only form that induces a response from infinite intelligence. How to develop faith? There comes now a statement which will give a better understanding of the importance the principle of autosuggestion assumes in the transmutation of desire into its physical or monetary equivalent. Namely, faith is a state of mind which may be induced or created by affirmation or repeated instructions to the subconscious mind through the principle of autosuggestion. Repetition of affirmation of orders to your subconscious mind is the only known method of voluntary development of the emotion of faith. No one is doomed to bad luck. There are millions of people who believe themselves doomed to poverty and failure because of some strange force over which they believe they have no control. They are the creators of their own misfortunes because of this negative belief, which is picked up by the subconscious mind and translated into its physical equivalent. In language which any normal human being can understand, we will describe all that is known about the principle through which faith may be developed where it does not already exist. Have faith in yourself, faith in the infinite. Before we begin, you should be reminded again that faith is the eternal elixir which gives life, power, and action to the impulse of thought. The foregoing sentence is worth reading a second time, and a third, and a fourth, it is worth reading aloud. Faith is the starting point of all accumulation of riches. Faith is the basis of all miracles and all mysteries which cannot be analyzed by the rules of science. Faith is the only known antidote for failure. Faith is the element, the chemical, which when mixed with prayer, gives one direct communication with infinite intelligence. Faith is the element which transforms the ordinary vibration of thought created by the finite mind of man into the spiritual equivalent. Faith is the only agency through which the cosmic force of infinite intelligence can be harnessed and used by man. Thoughts which are mixed with any of the feelings of emotions constitute a magnetic force which attracts other similar or related thoughts. Now let us go back to the starting point and become informed as to how the original seed of an idea, plan, or purpose may be planted in the mind. The information is easily conveyed. Any idea, plan, or purpose may be placed in the mind through repetition of thought. This is why you are asked to write out a statement of your major purpose or definite chief aim, committed to memory, and repeat it in audible words day after day until these vibrations of sound have reached your subconscious mind. Resolve to throw off the influences of any unfortunate environment and to build your own life to order. Taking inventory of mental assets and liabilities, you may discover that your greatest weakness is lack of self-confidence. This handicap can be surmounted and timidity translated into courage through the aid of the principle of auto-suggestion. The application of this principle may be made through a simple arrangement of positive thought impulses stated in writing, memorized, and repeated until they become a part of the working equipment of the subconscious faculty of your mind. Self-confidence formula. First, I know that I have the ability to achieve the object of my definite purpose in life. Therefore, I demand of myself persistent, continuous action toward its attainment and I here and now promise to render such action. Second, 
I realize the dominating thoughts of my mind will eventually reproduce themselves in outward physical action and gradually transform themselves into physical reality. Therefore, I will concentrate my thoughts for 30 minutes daily upon the task of thinking of the person I intend to become, thereby creating in my mind a clear mental picture. Third, I know through the principle of auto-suggestion, any desire that I persistently hold in my mind will eventually seek expression through some practical means of attaining the object back of it. Therefore, I will devote ten minutes daily to demanding of myself the development of self-confidence. Fourth, I have clearly written down a description of my definite chief aim in life, and I will never stop trying until I shall have developed sufficient self-confidence for its attainment. Fifth, I fully realize that no wealth or position can long endure unless built upon truth and justice. Therefore, I will engage in no transaction which does not benefit all whom it affects. I will succeed by attracting to myself the forces I wish to use and the cooperation of other people. I will induce others to serve me because of my willingness to serve others. I will eliminate hatred, envy, jealousy, selfishness, and cynicism by developing love for all humanity, because I know that a negative attitude toward others can never bring me success. I will cause others to believe in me because I will believe in them and in myself. I will sign my name to this formula, commit it to memory, and repeat it aloud once a day with full faith that it will gradually influence my thoughts and actions so that I will become a self-reliant and successful person. The Disaster of Negative Thinking The subconscious mind makes no distinction between constructive and destructive thought impulses. It works with the material we feed it through our thought impulses. The subconscious mind will translate into reality a thought driven by fear just as readily as it will translate into reality a thought driven by courage or faith. Like the wind which carries one ship east and another west, the law of auto-suggestion will lift you up or pull you down according to the way you set your sails of thought. Auto-suggestion, the medium for influencing the subconscious mind, the third step toward riches. Auto-suggestion is a term which applies to all suggestions and all self-administered stimuli which reach one's mind through the five senses. Stated in another way, auto-suggestion is self-suggestion. It is the agency of communication between that part of the mind where conscious thought takes place and that which serves as the seat of action for the subconscious mind. See and feel money in your hands. You were instructed in the last of the six steps described in the chapter on desire to read aloud twice daily the written statement of your desire for money and to see and feel yourself in possession of the money. By following these instructions, you communicate the object of your desire directly to your subconscious mind in a spirit of absolute faith. Through repetition of this procedure, you voluntarily create thought habits which are favorable to your efforts to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. Remember, therefore, when reading aloud the statement of your desire, through which you are endeavoring to develop a money consciousness, that the mere reading of the words is of no consequence unless you mix emotion or feeling with your words. Your subconscious mind recognizes and acts only upon thoughts which have been well mixed with emotion or feeling. Plain, unemotional words do not influence the subconscious mind. You will get no appreciable results until you learn to reach your subconscious mind with thoughts or spoken words which have been well emotionalized with belief. Do not become discouraged if you cannot control and direct your emotions the first time you try to do so. Remember, there is no such possibility as something for nothing. You cannot cheat even if you desire to do so. The price of ability to influence your subconscious mind is everlasting persistence in applying the principles described here. You cannot develop the desired ability for a lower price. You and you alone must decide whether or not the reward for which you are striving, the money consciousness, 
is worth the price you must pay for it in effort. Your ability to use the principle of auto-suggestion will depend very largely upon your capacity to concentrate upon a given desire until that desire becomes a burning obsession. Please fast forward to the end and turn the tape over for proper cueing of side two.